Thank you. Thank you so much, Goli. Thank you for that introduction. It's great to see everybody here, uh, theater in the round. Um, you guys, I looked at, the, uh, looked at the schedule. You've been hard at it. You know, are you ready for one more as my clock starts clicking? Let me warn you on the front end, when you see this presentation, I looked at the, the substantive uh, uh, presentations everybody else gave. Um, I warn you on the front end, they did actually ask me to talk about this. They told this title, but they actually said, how did you get from being kind of uh, involved to being in politics? So, you know, what better thing to ask a politician than come and talk about yourself for a little while? So, <laughs> yeah, I was really jazzed to come, and particularly considering my day job. Uh, this is really great. Um, let me, again, thank all of you for being here. Those of you who serve on the, the public side, those of you who serve on the private side, as a former IT guy, I want to give you a little of my story of how those, those two things interacted uh, in my life. Uh, what get measured, get done. That's kind of, you know, business school 101, um, but it is also something that has been uh, kind of a theme that I've tried to run through my public and private life. Let me see if I can get this done right. Where is the audio visual? There. All right. Whoops. Let's not go too fast. Uh, um, started. I'm going to be failing already here. Started back here. I actually grew up around the country. Um, didn't emphasize that when I ran for governor and senator from Virginia. Uh, but, uh, you know, came here, always was interested a little bit in politics, came here to Washington, um, worked on Capitol Hill as a freshman or a college student at George Washington. We dug this up out when Chris Dodd retired recently, uh, where he had offered me a job in between college and law school. Uh, so I ended up going to law school at Harvard, where I managed to become well known for one thing. I started the largest drinking organization in the history of Harvard Law School called the Somerville Bar Review that met at a different bar in Somerville every Thursday night, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> yeah, which was a great way to start. And then people say, you know, usually when you kind of hear these politician introductions, they always talk about, you know, and then... Mary or Bill did this and went from this success to that success. My life has actually been completely filled with uh, a path of uh, everything I've ever tried to do along the way I failed at. Um, a little different story than you normally hear. Uh, I'll always remember getting out of law school, decided not to practice law, uh, worked for the Democratic National Committee. After 18 months at that, decided I would go become an entrepreneur. And this kind of gets to the punchline. We'll always remember taking my life savings, $5,000, investing in it in a little energy startup company, went to work for that company, and in six weeks, I helped that company go totally broke. <laughs> I then went into real estate, moved to Atlanta, and that venture uh, failed in six months. So at the ripe old age of, at that point, I think 26 and a half, 27, I was flat broke, living out of my car, student loans coming due, but kind of only in an America, and only in a world that is changing by technology as much as everything else, I got a third try. Um, and that was, I got involved in the early 80s in the very beginning of the wireless industry, uh, which I will also always recall all my law school classmates at that point as I was staying in their fancy apartments, um, starting in wireless. Every one of them said to me without question, Warner, you are so crazy. Go get a real job. Who's going to want a car phone? <laughs> They're still billing in six-minute increments. So that led to, I got this chance to start uh, Nextel. So uh, that means also that uh, I saw many of you looking at your devices. I'm the, only, I'm the only speaker you'll have at any Fed Talk presentation or any presentation that says, even when I'm speaking, leave your cell phones on. Doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> Matter of fact, if they go off, you hear an annoying sound, I hear cha-ching, cha-ching. You know, punch them. <laughs> especially now that I'm a federal employee, I especially need you to leave them on. Well, that, that venture into business um, allowed me to start Nextel, then started Columbia Capital, which I started in 1989, grew into the largest venture capital fund here in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, now we're a little over $4 billion in uh, investments, uh, almost uh, about 175 companies mostly all in telecom and IT. Uh, so that it gave me a sense that as I thought about what to do with my life, you know, 
thinking about maybe coming back to public service and a little bit of a framing of kind of what gets measured gets done back to that theme, you know, too much of politics, too much of the issues that I think you grapple with, or at least I grapple with, and maybe less so you guys because you're kind of on the front lines, you know, is still thought about in the old framework of liberal versus conservative or left versus right, when in reality most issues that we face, and as IT professionals you know this better than most everyone, are much more future versus past. Are we willing to use technology, which is only a tool in itself, not a goal in itself, but to really allow technology to be disruptive in terms of transforming how we run our enterprises, how we run our lives, how we empower people. And so after starting Columbia Capital, after Nextel, that was kind of um, um, my sense of what value add, if you're going to measure things, uh, that I would go about. So started um, uh, the idea in the mid-90s of saying, all right, um, ended up by luck with Nextel and these venture firms doing better than I ever could have hoped, thinking about coming back into public life. But again, rather than just try to do good deeds, how do you do things that can, that can measure? So started a series of uh, venture capital funds all across Virginia. Because one of the promises of the information age was you can build it anywhere. Time and distance are going to disappear. That's been proven to be true. What we've not proven, and we've seen that you can build it in Mumbai, you can build it in Bangalore, you can build it in Shanghai, one of the things we've not done as good a job of, in Virginia for that matter in the country, is showing that you can build disruptive 21st century ideas, not just in major metropolitan areas, but in rural and smaller towns. One of the greatest opportunities of an information age should be you shouldn't have to leave your hometown to find a world-class job. Well, good news was I started these series of venture capital funds. Bad news was I started them right at the beginning of the dot-com bust. Uh, uh, they, they, some of them are still in existence down in southwest Virginia, but it was quite a journey. Started as well to say, how do you start some innovative nonprofits? Well, um, started the Virginia Healthcare Foundation. How to use technology and tools in a public private way to deliver health care. How do you do tech writers, which was a notion of how do you teach people, and particularly rural communities, about the power of technology, power of IT? Well, my sense was this is something that was scary to people. Where would be the most appropriate people, place for people to learn? If you can't go into somebody's living room, where else will people feel comfortable? Well, I thought the house of worship. So we hired a bunch of kids, kind of like the 60s freedom riders concept around voting, but this was around tech riders that would go around from church to church or mosque or synagogue and spend a week and basically do uh, tech education back in the mid-90s. Senior navigator. My mom had Alzheimer's for 10 years. Um, it was horrible watching my father try to take care of her. You know, but one of the things I tried to realize was, how do you use technology to help caregivers help your loved ones? So this initiative, which is still going on about nine years uh, around, locates everywhere in Virginia where there are, where there are assistance communities uh, and a whole series of kind of how-to for people, um, uh, caregivers or their loved ones. This is a little more detail than I thought. This is the first time I've actually used this, uh, this slideshow, so my apologies to all of you. Started a Virginia High Tech Partnership. Um, I sit on the board of one of the historically black colleges in Virginia, and it struck me as, as tech companies in Northern Virginia were saying, we can't find talent, yet none of them had ever gone and looked at the five historically black colleges in Virginia. So started an initiative that now is 15 years and running, where we've gotten more kids from HBCUs into the tech community uh, than even the UNCF. Uh, and one of the, again, one of the opportunities I found around tech, why I think it's, it's so exciting is, you know, there is no kind of, or isn't as much old boy network, because at least when I remember on the wireless network, there were no, that, not many old boys. You know, uh, technology is something that can be truly empowering. Uh, if we use it the right way, you've got to measure your results. If we use it the right way, um, but it also can be extraordinarily debilitating and leaving be people behind in a way that, uh, quite honestly, even previous waves of transformation have not taken place. So spent a period of time, after having some success at business, after the early failures, uh, doing the nonprofit world. But decided that I would come back to um, um, take the plunge in politics again. 
basically because I'd always thought I would. And I thought, oh my gosh, I don't want to be on my deathbed and say I never had the courage to actually try. My folks who put this together, though, skipped an important step here. I did run for governor, one as governor, what they forgot and left out amongst that theme of trying and not always being successful. I did one, run one other time before running for governor. I actually ran for the United States Senate one other time back in 1996 against John Warner, uh, which was, for those of you who didn't live here at that point, a confusing as hell race, <laughs> Warner versus Warner. <laughs> and you know, here he was, a distinguished senior senator, and he's become a he, great, great friend, and people of Virginia are pretty smart hiring him instead of me. Uh, but here I was, the new high-tech guy trying to um, um, get into this race. It was, it, we were way behind, ended up being fairly close. But to give you a flavor of that race, of kind of how unknown I was, my name, of course, being Mark Warner, his name, name being John Warner, we had a bumper strip, honest to goodness truth on it, that simply said, Mark, not John. <laughs> and you may know where this is headed, but honest to God, in Danville, Virginia, down around the North Carolina border, I got out one day, this guy looked at me and said, see that bumper strip, is that a biblical reference? <laughs> well, I got the silver medal in that race. Uh, but again, kind of one of the things, major, uh, remarkable thing about it in politics is you can lose and win. People thought I was going to get blown out, I ended up getting close, and in the intervening time, said, all right, what can I spend using this what limited knowledge I had of technology as a way to empower? That's where I showed you some of those, um, uh, those initiatives I started as, as a private citizen. But I thought, well, let me go try to be governor. Ended up winning. Uh, I'll always remember you know, kind of winning and losing. Became governor. Literally got in and take a, got a chance to take a look at the books within the first couple of weeks. The $1 billion deficit Virginia had suddenly was a $6 billion deficit when he got a chance to look at the books. I always remember looking at the people of Virginia and saying, is it too late for a recount? Um, <laughs> but one of the things, and this is going to fast forward at some point when you get to um, you know, my current day job, you know, not to, not to overstate the case, but if you think about in the technology field how you use it as a way to be a disruptive force, to transform things. You know, not to paraphrase Rahm Emanuel by any means, but crisis also still pre presents opportunities. So here we had Virginia, which had been well managed by Democrats and Republicans generally, uh, but you know, we had this enormous, enormous shortfall. Uh, some of you remember the famous no car tax slogan, which was what had driven us into that shortfall. But we used it as an opportunity to do a dramatic reworking of Virginia state government consolidating agencies, moving things around, something that got this crowd would be one of the few places that would actually still think was cool. We uh, major, made major IT consolidation. I remember coming in as governor saying, how much does the Commonwealth of Virginia spend on IT? It took us nine months and a million dollar outsourced contract to figure out the answer. <laughs> it was close to a billion dollars, but it was in a total mismatch. We consolidated that. We decided, how do we bring other business principles? I'm not one of those guys who believes business can always be uh, completely translated to government, but there are tools, again, using technology. We managed our real estate portfolio in a consolidated fashion. We did purchasing, group purchasing agreements. I always like to say that uh, we lowered the price of light bulbs and fleet management, which I think particularly on purchasing. We lowered the price of light bulbs from 38 cents to 23 cents. That doesn't close a $6 billion shortfall, but we buy a hell of a lot of light bulbs in the state of Virginia. <laughs> but using the challenges around a budget crisis to force reexamination of business practices, oftentimes driven by IT, was very valuable. In addition, did things here, something called the, the VEDA system that, that literally back in the dark ages of 2002, Virginia was at the cutting edge of online state purchasing. And in, this effort has now been uh, incorporated by lots of local governments and other governments around, around the, the country. We ended up as well, what's this next slide? Doing targeted reforms, which are still a blank sheet. No, all right. <laughs> I think this is going to get into too much detail. This, we changed our education system. We basically expanded our children's health to cover 400,000 kids, had the highest sign up of, uh, of children in children's health in, in the whole 
country at that point. Again, driven by a collaboration between our state, religious organizations, other private sectors, but driven again by our IIT system that made it easier so that there was not a multi-page sign-up for children's, for the CHIP program or Medicaid, consolidated into a single form and you get results. VDOT, well, kind of fixed it. <laughs> you know, even I, looking at y'all, can't lie that much in front of you, but you know. <laughs> but we did, let me just, you know, when I started, 85% of all projects were not on time and over budget. At the end of four years, we switched that around that over 75% were on time and on budget. So still not enough dough, and Lord knows traffic is still bad, but made at least some progress. Came back to that passion I had from the early days of the venture capital funds. How do you make sure that you shouldn't have to leave your home, hometown? So working with our tobacco funds actually did the largest expansion of rural broadband of any state in the country, mostly down in Southside Virginia. And, you know, again, what I tried to always hold, and I'm a Democrat with a two to one Republican legislature, when I was governor, if you can find a way to collaborate together, if you can find ways to use tools of technology to move forward, you know, you get measurement. And Virginia was ranked best managed state, best state for lifelong learning, best state for business, um, and so forth. And what, which also, more importantly, by working with the legislature, particularly around, around fiscal issues, and we did a big tax reform effort in 2004. We managed to not make it Democrat versus Republican, and at the end of the time, we earned these rankings because people in Virginia thought we were all kind of rowing in the same direction, something that is sadly absent from the, my current day job. So in 2008, got elected senator. Thought I'd bring back the Chris Dodd thing. I kind of went full circle from working as a kid for him to working on the banking committee. At, down at the bottom on the kids' table, as there were so many Democrats, I was sitting on the extra table, but worked with him on the, uh, the Dodd-Frank legislation. Good guy, he's retired. Um, this is the one, this is something I'm very proud of, uh, and you may be the only audience that would even have the remotest interest in, in this. <laughs> I call it the smallest little bill nobody's ever heard of. GIPRA, the Government Performance Results Modernization Act, which does basically uh, three things. It says you got to state your agency goals. If you got 30 goals or 40 goals, you, got, you don't have any goals. If you don't have three to five targeted goals, you do not have something you can measure against. We said you got to be able to put out your program results. And, well, it's not listed here, the most important thing is we finally required agencies, and this is the first year the feds have actually gone through with this to not only report those programs that are doing well, but re report programs that are underperforming. Again, back to the theme here. You gotta measure things, you shouldn't also be afraid of failure. You know, if you only identify what works, and you're not willing to identify what doesn't work, particularly in times of $17 trillion in debt, we're never gonna get this through. So, um, I have, since I've got here, have been obsessed about the debt. Uh, I started this so-called Gang of Six. I think it is very cool working where I work right now. Only place in the world where being a gang member is a good thing. <laughs> you know, the good news is we're down to a minute and 20 seconds. I won't give you the whole uh, budget spiel, other than the fact that it's $17 trillion in debt that goes up $4 billion a day. If we can't work better with you, whether you're on the public side or the private side, if we don't get this fixed, if we don't pierce this kind of partisan veil and think that, you know, that we have to take ideas from both sides, if we don't generate more revenues into entitlement reforms, then every other function that you try to perform are going to be on a basis that's not going to be successful. Right now, and this is not a, in a partisan, this is a business comment, the House budget proposal, the House proposal which we're kind of on the path to with this stupidity of sequestration, let's give you one data point takes domestic discretionary spending, which is only 16% of our total federal spend. And you all know what that means, but from a business standpoint, that means every dollar that we spend at the federal level for education, for infrastructure, and R&D, takes that 16%, as well as energy, law enforcement, and a host of other things, takes that 16% and over 11 years takes it to 4%. Take off any policy hat, put on your business hat, 
would you ever invest in a business that spent less than 5% of its revenues educating and training its workforce? Investing in its plant and equipment, i.e. infrastructure, and staying ahead of the competition, research, and development. So we have to find a way to get this issue behind us. So doing a series of other things, housing reform, National Infrastructure Bank, I'll, I'll skip all this. I'll close with uh, these comments. I like this clicker here. Um, you know, you guys are going to have to be part of this. Uh, I, I am so obsessed about the debt and deficit. Other senators head the other direction sometimes when they see me coming because they get the, get the full dose, full on. Whether you are on the private sector side or on the public side, we're going to have to think about a way to do things better. They're going to have to be measurable. But we're also going to need, you're going to need to demand from us certain things. And I'll, I'll close with this. Um, you're going to need to demand us to have to be willing to check our Democrat and Republican hats for a while. To be willing to tell the truth. We can't fix our, way, our problem with this debt and deficit by simply cutting. We are going to have to generate additional revenues. We are going to have to reform our entitlement programs. Medicare and Social Security, the greatest programs ever. When I was a kid, there were 16 people working for every one person on retirement. Today, there are three people working for every one on retirement. In 15 years, it'll be two to one. The math doesn't work. So here's my request to you. Two things. One, do not support any candidate for public office that signs one of these stupid pledges. <laughs> I don't care if the pledge is to never raise taxes or never touch Social Security. Anybody that starts with a pledge, they don't deserve to be hired. Second thing we need to do is we all have to get out of our own personal comfort zones a little bit, political foxholes. Acknowledge the fact that both Fox and MSNBC lie. <laughs> you know? And what you need to do next time it comes around, if you're a Democrat in this room, and there's a Republican who's willing to be courageous enough to go out there and say the truth to the Grover Norquist types, we've got to raise revenue, support them. If you're a Republican and there's a Democrat out there who's willing to say to AARP, Social Security, a great program, but the math doesn't work, we've got to reform them, support them. Until we can support and are willing to put kind of our ideas of what we want in our elected officials actually into work, until we're willing to kind of reinforce the behavior that we want, then we're not going to get ourselves out of this problem. What gets measured gets done. And what gets measured ought to be our performance as well as yours. I have great faith that we're going to get through this. Um, and uh, you know, I, I will close, close with this as I go over uh, 2 minutes and 30, 55 seconds. <laughs> there are moments when I get really discouraged in this job. And uh, I know, you know, now, nobody will repeat this, of course. I know we're just intimately here, us. <laughs> but in those moments, I get most depressed. Oh, my God, are these guys going to really work together? Why can't we get this done? This is, shouldn't be this hard. I always fall back for, the, uh, for a kind of a rhythm of hope from a great quote from Winston Churchill. It was early in World War II. The Nazis had conquered all of Europe. There was a question about what America would do, whether we intervene in the war or not. They were bombing the heck out of Britain. Churchill, in an effort to rally the people of Britain, got up and gave this speech. And I won't try to do a Churchill accent, but as only Churchill could say, he stood up and he said, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> well, I kind of feel like we're at that point in our politics. We've tried everything else. It's time for us to do the right thing. You deserve it whether you work inside the government or whether you assist the government. You deserve it because uh, we all ought to get the kind of fair shots that I got. And you deserve it because uh, that's what's going to take America great. But you've got to demand that from us or fire us all. Thank you all very much.